Hi little berries, Ari Berry here. Now I've been away for a while and there's a damn good reason for that. This video comprises three different things. My Emmy and one diaries, anecdotes with Ari, and I'm going to be showing you this bubble clay mask. God, I love it. Let's start putting this on. Now this is a bubble mask that's gonna really foam up so as I'm putting it on. I will be telling you all about what has happened. The first thing I'm going to do before I do anything is I'm just going to pull this down. I'm going to show you something. Gross alert. Have a look. I've had an operation. I've only ever had a skin tag removed before. This is therefore my first proper surgery. One of the main glands that this stupid gene affects is the parathyroids. Now the parathyroids are basically situated, what I call in the eyes of the thyroid gland if you think of a butterfly you know a butterfly wings sometimes you you can see what looks like eyes um if you think of the thyroid gland as the butterfly think of the parathyroids as as the eyes basically we all have four parathyroids sometimes people have five in very unique cases. God, you can see it's already bubbling. What happens is when you are developing in the uterus, the parathyroids start out quite up high and they eventually drop down to the throat. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes they get stuck and particularly um, those with MEM1, quite potentially they can end up with an extra one or whatever. But in pretty much every case of um, someone with MEM1, <laughs> they end up um, with um, hyperparathyroidism. When I was having my initial tests for um, like how the gene was affecting me, one of the things they were testing was the parathyroid level, but also calcium, because that's what hyperparathyroidism um, does. It, it means that you end up with excessive calcium, because the parathyroid hormone is supposed to regulate the amount of calcium your blood has at any one time. Wow, it's really foamy. Bloody hell. The problem with calcium when it's excessive in the blood is that um, your kidneys end up under quite a bit of pressure to flush them out. So therefore, calcification can build up and I found out 18 months ago that I had and still have um, two kidney stones. I also had a DEXA bone scan and it turned out I have uh, lower than normal bone density, although not terribly low. What they did was they said I had slight osteopenia, which is the stage before osteoporosis. And if MEM1 is not diagnosed or, or treated in time, I'll leave my hands now, people can end up with kidney issues, uh, osteoporosis, but also calcium has a profound effect as well. I just saw a bit of a bubble there. It has a profound effect on um, the brain. It can cause brain fog and confusion, concentration issues. Um, it can cause headaches, issues with the, the periods, um, tiredness, fatigue, um, bloating, um, aches and pains, all kinds of stuff. About a year ago, I said to um, my endocrinologist, I'd like to have a parath... Uh, parathyroidectomy i'd like to have this nipped in the bud in january of this year i went to st thomas's hospital and spoke to the consultant endocrinologist there they said to me that yes it's a good idea to have my parathyroids out because my levels were high not terribly high but high and of course the two kidney stones were a concern so they booked me in for the 14th of april now of course we all know what happened afterwards. Well, around about the time I went to St. Thomas's, it was actually happening. It was starting to happen for me. It's really bubbly. Rub it in. It's, it's tingling a bit as well. I assumed that my surgery would be cancelled. So I phoned St. Thomas's uh, about a few weeks after the consultation. And they said yes. Um, basically... Um, all the consultants and the beds and everything they had to prioritize coronavirus victims quite rightly too um it would have been extremely ooh. see the the camera's the opposite right way around so it's a bit weird <laughs> um 
quite rightly to, you know, they have to prioritise lives, you know, so I fully expected that my procedure would be delayed. And of course, nobody knew at the time um, exactly how um, COVID was going to pan out. Um, God, it's itchy. So I left it for a few months. I lost my mum. I had other things to think about. A few months later, I phoned and said, do you have any idea when it might be? They said, we'll let you know. There are some other people who are waiting to have theirs. On the 8th of September, um, I was at lunch break from work and I'm working from home at the moment. And my phone went and it was St. Thomas's. And they said, we now would like to book you in for your procedure. And I was like, okay. And they said, um, how about the 14th of September? That's on Monday. The 8th was a Tuesday. Monday? Yeah. And I was like, well, what do I do about pre-op assessment they said oh don't worry it'll be a phone phone call and they also said how I could get there they said they they said do not take public transport I had to be there at 11 o'clock on Monday the 14th of September oh, massage this in again it's all pumping. oh I love it so much and they said don't yeah do not take um public transport do not take a taxi we will arrange for um, someone to come and collect you, like an ambulance or a replacement ambulance. And they told me not to have anything to drink after six o'clock and not to eat anything, um, I think, after five o'clock. I can't quite remember. Oh, God, this is really itchy. Oh, God, every time I touch it, I can feel the bubbles. <laughs> um, God, it's wonderful. I love it. I'm going to go take it off in a minute because it's, um, yeah and put some moisturiser on because I'm getting my skin's quite dry and itchy. I was really, really excited, but I was really nervous. I had actually already booked that week off work, coincidentally, so I didn't have to book any time off or anything, but I had to let my boss know that I would probably need another week after that off. I need to take this off, sorry. Well, that took quite a bit of doing. Um, My face is all wet at the moment because I, I had to rub ice an ice cube on my face it was burning i put i put two loads of hyaluronic acid like really thick and then i put moisturizer on and it really really stung um so i had to put ice on so i've just left my face wet so it can dry naturally so talk about short notice six days in six days you're having your first ever major operation your first ever general anesthesia and i was excited for the most part i was also kind of i was i was kind of um sorry i'm really itchy <laughs> i was kind of really scared about risks but then that's a for god's sake the risks with this type of operation is there's a risk of permanent damage to the vocal cords or semi-permanent so it could take months for my voice to come back if i accidentally cut my vocals there is also, um, you know, having a very, very sore throat or a throat infection, um, scarring. Of course, you're going to get that with every operation. Um, but what I was a bit wary of was the anesthesia, because that is a big part of an operation. The anesthesiologist really has a lot of power in their hands to either give you just a little bit too much or just a bit too little, because they have to do it based on your weight. Like an idiot, I googled both the procedure um, and anesthesia. I watch videos about people with people being all hysterical or really distressed and I don't know why I watched them but I did. I had no idea what I was gonna be like so I went into it kind of blind. I knew I was gonna stay overnight. It was, it's not a day surgery, it's inpatient stay. On the morning I was told to be ready by seven o'clock. I'd had a bath the night before, um, I'd made sure I got myself ready. I didn't have anything to drink after. I think I got up at five and um, got myself all sorted and everything. Um, I had my bag packed already. A car ride to London from my hometown. To get to London will take you less than an hour. But to <laughs> it's one thing to get to London, but once you're in London, once you're in the congested area of London, you're better off walking because you, you can walk about as fast as a car travels quite often. When the time came for me to expect the car to come and get me, it didn't arrive. 
I got a phone call from the uh, the transport service and they said, we'll be with you in about 15 minutes. 20, 25 minutes went by and nothing. So I phoned them and they said, we're so sorry, we'll be there in a few minutes. Nothing for another half an hour. I phoned them again and I said, I need to get to hospital by 11 o'clock. It's gone nine o'clock. And you know, and, and I was really, really anxious. And they said, yes, fine, we'll be, we'll be there in a few minutes. And a driver was there, but it wasn't from the transport agency. They'd actually just got a private taxi. And eventually they arrived. I had to go really, really straight away. So to say goodbye to the wife was, you know, see you in 24 hours or whatever. And that's it. I was on the way to London. The driver did take one wrong turning. Um, misread his GPS. I actually ended up being about half an hour late. Um, the traffic was just horrific. Um, it took an hour to travel. I'm not kidding. It took an hour to travel nine miles. I might as well have just got out and walked. What happened was outside St. Thomas's, there's a long stretch of road and there was a big traffic jam. And the driver said to me, just get out now, <laughs> go. <laughs> Got straight out over the road and into the hospital. And when I arrived, I was told to, you know, like you normally do, told to wait. I was waiting for like five seconds and was told, okay, Aaron, come along. If, if you've ever been in an NHS hospital, they take data protection extremely seriously. They check and recheck and recheck and recheck all of your details. Every single person who sees you rechecks your details, even if one person has just done it. So the check my details and they showed me into what looked like um you know like a changing rooms at a, at a, at a clothes shop so you got the big you got the main hall and then you got the the rooms either side but there were computer monitors everywhere there were um, stations with lots of equipment and um, I was shown into a cubicle and I they went through all of my information they went through allergies they, they went through that a lot I'm allergic to a wall I'm allergic to nickel um and they then went through what I understood the procedure to be, what my medications were, um, any anxiety I was feeling as well. And then they gave me a gown and some mesh, that's the only way I can describe it, some meshy, not very flattering knickers. Just, and I had a bit of a job getting them on because they weren't elastic, they, you know, they were, they were weird very strange knickers. They said, yes, take everything off, put on the gown, and this is how you do it up. So they helped me do it up. And then I had to put on the uh, face mask and a cap. Now I took some photos, so I'll, I'll show you those. And I sent some of those photos to the wife, uh, and say, oh, this is how I'm looking right now, looking very sexy. They did my blood pressure, they did my weight and my height, and they had trouble finding my pulse as well. They had to try, because they, they put the, the blood pressure monitor on one arm and then they check the other, the, the fingers on the other hand and they had to check several, several of them. Um, I have what most people have is white coat syndrome. When my blood pressure is taken, it spikes. Um, after a little while it starts to calm down, um, but it usually spikes straight away, so I just relaxed, looked away, and it turned out my blood pressure was okay. I didn't see what the reading was, but either way. Then the um, anaesthetist came to see me, and again she checked my data, and she showed me a device which looked like a big, thick door handle, like a hook. And she said, this is what's going to go down your throat. Thanks. You know, I really wanted to know that. It, it wasn't small, it was about that thick. And it was hooked, like it had a point and it was not bendy or flexible or anything. And she said, you will end up with a sore throat, particularly because you're having throat surgery. <laughs> Great. Then she talked me through the um, anesthetic procedure. And I said, well, uh, is it okay if I can ask you not to ask me to count back from 100? which some of them do. I don't want to know when you're doing it, just do it. And um, and she said, well, we don't do that anymore, apparently. They don't ask you to count backwards anymore. Um, so I said, okay, fine. And she said, um, it would just literally like be like one minute you're awake and the next minute you're awake again. 
and it and it would have been done and you wouldn't know and you will feel very very sleepy just beforehand because we'll give you something to help you relax i was waiting about two hours my or just before it came around to my turn the actual surgeon came around to see me and he, he my surgeon's great he's the best at what he does but he's very he's very much a case of he doesn't like the glory he doesn't like to stick around he doesn't like the niceties he just wants to get on and do it um he just says right this is what we're going to do Aaron. now if i haven't told you before your parathyroids start up in your head when you're a fetus and they move all the way down i said yes you've already told me i didn't say quite like that and i didn't see him again well i didn't see him again um i was then taken when it was eventually my turn, I think I was one of the last on the list uh, for the procedures that day. I was taken into a room where there were three nurses and the anesthesiologist. I was asked to lie down on the, uh, the, the bed. They lowered it for me. And when I was doing that, they got me to go right to the very edge of the bed. So my head was almost off the edge of the bed. And while they were there they then um put the blood pressure cuff on me and then they put the uh, cannula into my hand which really did hurt actually especially when they were taping it down and because it, it it did hurt quite a bit and i'm not normally afraid of needles but um the 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 anesthesiologist said to me that she was she would need to do another one in the other hand but she would wait until i was asleep so they said what well, the first of all they said they were going to before that actually she said she was going to give me some gas which is part of the anesthetic process but what she did then was she put the mask over my face not tight just just lightly and she said fill your lungs up with oxygen to take three deep breaths and i did and after three i said right i've done three and she said no 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 keep going and then one of the other nurses was fiddling about with the candle on my hand. She goes, right, I'm going to give you something that will make you a bit woozy. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, it, I've, I've had sedation before when I had the endoscopy. But um, this is... The, 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 my eyes were like, what, 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 what the hell is going on? And I was thinking, don't fall asleep, don't fall asleep. Try and resist, try and resist. And then I remember nothing. Until I heard someone calling my name... I didn't recognize this person because the three people in the three four people that were in the room with me at the time I was falling asleep were all female and then I was in the room with two males and I didn't know who they were and I was opening my eyes and I was sat almost upright in a different room and I could feel a slight tenderness on my neck. They were going, Erin, Erin, Erin. And they had a cup of water and they were getting me to drink. I was really dehydrated. Even though they give you a drip when, you, when you're under, I was really thirsty. And they were going, do you want some more? And I went, yeah, yeah. And I was drinking it. And I went, can I have some more? And I was drinking and drinking and drinking. And I could feel in my throat, it was very swollen inside. And one of the gentlemen was talking to me, but I couldn't really understand what he was saying. And I don't know what was going through my head at the time, but I do remember hearing him finish his sentence by saying, do you have any questions? What was my burning question? How tall is Mount Everest? He said, well, I, I, we can answer quite a few questions and I think your surgeon would be able to, but that question I don't think we know the answer to. And I went, oh, right, right, I'm going to need my phone then. And then I went to gesture to underneath the, the, um, the bed because that's where my belongings were put underneath it but they went no 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 so they laid me back down not quite i was on about 45 degree angle and then they wheeled me to a recovery ward now the, the wheeling to the ward seemed to take forever and it kind of emote it kind of evoked the memory of um driving through london going through the hospital because st thomas's hospital a bit like guy's hospital is very tall and I was taken to the ninth floor, I think, first. So quiet, I remember. It's, it wasn't hustling and bustling. It was a really quiet place. And this particular ward only had four booths. And I was put in one nearest the entrance and I could see people moving in and out. By the time I got there, it was 10 to 6. And I was hungry. But my throat was really bad. And because it was quite late, um, dinner had finished for the day so they were bringing people sandwiches and stuff so i had a tuna sandwich um and they bought me a carton of like some tropical fruit drink which was beautiful absolutely lovely and a year valley strawberry yogurt 
wonderful, wonderful. It was amazing. I was going to ask for another one. My throat was a bit sore, but I could still speak. It was a, My throat was quite husky. But I actually felt physically... I've never felt more relaxed, except when I've had massages and stuff, but um, I felt so zen. And there was a lady in the cubicle next to me, and she'd had a parathyroidectomy, but for different reason. And she was being checked out at that time. The porter came along and got her and put her in a wheelchair to take her out to the public transport. And um, she, even though with COVID and everything, she shook my hand to say goodbye. And of course, I had to, we had to sanitise afterwards to make sure and everything. Um, I was um, then sort of drifting in and out of sleep, but it was kind of, kind of a non-sleep. It was more of the after effects of the sedation. I was like, Ugh. and I was then given a painkiller um, and then told to take, now I'll show you what they look like. This is called ADCAL. It's basically calcium carbonate. Now, when it goes into your stomach, um, your stomach juices, they um, basically break up the molecule. So the calcium goes into your body and the carbonate, which is the carbon and oxygen, just goes elsewhere and they're actually quite nice they're supposed to they're sort of fruit flavored but apparently not everybody likes them but they're quite nice um i was then told after about two hours that that was not the ward i was sleeping on i had to go to another ward and this one had six booths now it was very dark i remember and again very very quiet i have to say the nurses um and the staff were exemplary we have a fantastic nhs they they were they were so good and th there was actually one lady on that ward uh, there, were, there were three there were six women on the ward um and it was late now you know we we're trying to sleep and there was one woman who had apparently been there for about five days and she had pissed everybody off because she was making groaning noises constantly and I mean it wasn't I thought it was sleep apnea or something but it this wasn't but then as I listened to it it wasn't um, involuntary it was someone making a point um, she kept going mm, mm, and it was constant it went the whole night and on two occasions, a particular nurse told her to shut up. And she'd been doing it for five days. For, and it, she'd done it all the way through the night. And someone told me it was because she was in a lot of pain. But then the next day, when a nurse came around to do an assessment with her, she said, why are you groaning? And the woman just said, it's just who I am. She said the night before, could you just be quiet? People are trying to sleep. And she said, well, just let them sleep. They can sleep. She didn't make any apologies. And she was really rude to the staff. She was saying things like, where's my pudding? Like... I want another ice lolly. She was talking about her bodily functions like really loudly as well. Nobody really wanted to hear it. I was only there overnight and for quite a, uh, quite a bit of the next day. Um, so it wasn't too much of a problem. And I had a drain as well. Um, so this, um, I think, you can, can you s about there, there. That's where the drain was. And it was like a bottle um, which connected via a vacuum. So it was draining all the blood out. And I had to take that with me everywhere I went. I didn't have a drip or anything. Um, I only slept two hours that night. Not so much because of that that lady. She was a bit further away from me. But it still was enough for me to, um, you know, to, to notice it. But at the same time, I still, I think I still could have slept okay. Um, I felt very sorry for the people sitting near her though. The next day, um, I didn't know what time I was going to go. I just hung around for a bit, um, chatted with a few people, um, and then after a while I thought, you know what, I just really want to get up and get dressed. So I went and had a, I had a shower, I got myself dressed, and I just sat around for a bit. I really didn't do much the next day, but one thing I really wanted more than anything in the world was I seriously wanted a McDonald's milkshake. My throat was really, really sore. I've had pharyngitis before. It was almost like that. Not quite as bad, but almost like that. So um, near St. Thomas's in London is Waterloo um, Station. And there's a McDonald's there. That was the closest one. So um, I actually ordered two strawberry McDonald's milkshakes. And because um, the... the the nurses said, yeah, people order food all the time. So they, 
I put the name of the ward on it and they brought it up and um, oh my god it was amazing. Um, I had some bloods taken. Um, I had some taken before the appointment as well because they do all kinds of tests. And they came back and said your calcium is quite low. We may need you to stay another night. Then I had um, the consultant team come around and see me. Not my surgeon. It, he was like a, a assistant consultant with other people coming round and we were talking about MEM1 and they said what you know what they had done and they said there was one parathyroid that had um experienced hyperplasia it was causing the problem but they left me with half a parathyroid and um they said what symptoms I had to look out for now the symptoms of low calcium are very much like if you've ever hit your funny bone and besides the pain it's painful you get that tingling in your arm or if you lie in a si certain situation you wake up in the night or whatever and your arm is tingling your legs are tingling and you just f flex a little bit and shake it or get up and walk around and after a few moments of pins and needles it goes low calcium feels like that throughout your whole body particularly the hands and feet um i could feel it in like it was almost like it was in both of my lap muscles and the back going all the way up and it almost like I had a ring of tingling around my head. I got that the next day. However, going back a bit, they said to me to look out for that and if I if I was tingling a lot, I should take two of these, I have to take two at a time, four times a day and also um, a replacement parathyroid um, hormone called alpha calcidol three times a day if i find that i'm not tingling so much or hot not tingling at all i take two alpha calcidol a day and three times a day take two adcal um i then heard from the uh the nurse who said to me actually we're okay that your calcium isn't dangerously low we've told you what to look out for and what what can happen and if you need an infusion of calcium the local hospitals for me can do that so um, I was waiting for quite some time actually for the hospital transport and I was so tired because I the, the sedation was starting to wear off and the genuine tiredness started to kick in and so I, I was fully dressed at this point but I just laid down on the, on the bed and, and I had a kit for a little while and then they said oh well, they're going to be here in a minute and then they said oh no they're not they're not coming for a bit and then they said to me oh erin actually um since yesterday the procedures have changed if you're not vulnerable if you're able-bodied and you know if you're able to get yourself home we can't take you home you're gonna have to get home yourself but it's okay um you can get an uber you can get a taxi and i'm like yeah do you know how much it's gonna cost a two-hour journey out of london is gonna cost me over a couple of hundred quid to get home I, that's something i can't afford the only other way for me to get home would be by train but is that a good idea you know i'd have to go from st thomas's to the uh, station at waterloo um which in itself is about 10 15 minute walk which in the grand scheme of things isn't long but i've just had an operation i've just had general anesthesia i've never had a procedure before so i didn't know what i would be like in that situation i felt quite wobbly as well i then have to go through the station up to Water waterloo east to get the train home generally speaking you shouldn't really be on public transport after having an operation anyway because your immune system is compromised and it probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to be in a situation where anyone around me could be carriers of COVID-19. I was really anxious and I phoned my brother and I asked if he could come and get me. He was working though, because he runs his own business. And if he could come and get me, it wouldn't be till much, much later that night. And it would be very, very difficult. And I said, look, I'd, I'd pay you petrol for you. I can afford to do that at least. But ultimately it wasn't possible. He said, well, if it, if you absolutely have to, then I'll come and get you. But let's see, see what else can, you know, can be done. I was really anxious. I was thinking, oh, fuck, how am I, how am I going to get home? And I phoned the wife and said, look, the, I'm going to have to get the train. I don't, I don't want to. Um, my brother did say that he can come and get me from the train station to take me home. That wouldn't be a problem. Um, but I was really worried about, you know, what if I'd passed out? on the train or at the station what if i'd 
had a moment where I, you know, where I just couldn't physically move, you know, I was really worried because I felt so weak, I felt really, I didn't feel right at all. I just had a flipping operation, of course I didn't feel right. And then I thought, you know, I can't, no, 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 this isn't on, you know, I'm autistic as well. You know, being in a public place on my own, traveling home on my own after having a major procedure, I wasn't comfortable with this. So I said to the nurse, look, I, I know that you said that's a change in the procedure, but I don't think it's right that you should be expecting me to, to, to travel home by train, which will take me in itself an hour and 45 minutes, actually just on the train. And that's not waiting for the train or anything. Um, you know, and, and being a, you know, a big open environment with loads and loads of people. You know, I, I said, I, I don't think it's right. And it's going to be, um, it's going to be really late by the time I get back. And I said, I'm autistic as well. I, I get anxious when it comes to things like this anyway, you know, going, traveling around London on my own in itself, but even if not having a, um, an operation it is is quite daunting um so she said okay fine we'll we'll see what we can do the nurse on duty that day she basically said you need to take her home to, to the ambulance staff um she really fought tooth and nail and they agreed to take me home the two gentlemen who came to collect me were also taking another lady from king's um hospital in london to another hospital called King's, um, about 30 miles away, I think. Um, and so we had to go and collect her. Um, but the, the gentleman who sat with me in the back of the ambulance, um, he was just lovely. I was, you know, chatting away to him. And um, it took a long time to get back, um, probably about as long, if not longer, than it would have taken on the train, but at least I wasn't in a massive crowd at least I didn't have to navigate my own way home. And I did say to the guy, you guys have saved my life. I don't, I would not have been able to cut, get home by train. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would have, even if physically I couldn't do it, I would have had a complete mental breakdown. Um, I, you know, I probably would have ended up back in hospital. You know, I probably would have fallen or whatever. I, I don't know what would have happened. And he almost cried. He said, it's amazing to hear you say that. That's why we do this job. And they are really, they're just wonderful people who work for other people, who, who go into a profession which is so thankless, so selfless. They do voluntary shifts as well. They, they, it's, it's just an amazing thing. They did, they did give me the choice of lying down on the stretcher because I was so, tired I was, I was just ready to crash um but they said if if I had to get up they would have to stop in order and turn the engine off in order for me to get up if I wanted to and I said no, no I'm fine but the actual seats in an ambulance are not very comfortable um the lady was taken to her destination they took me straight home they were not allowed to even just drop me nearby legally they had to drop me right outside my house when I got in the first thing I really wanted was a cup of tea um and I went to bed within half an hour of getting home. The next day, I woke up feeling kind of twitchy. That's the only way I can put it. Or I felt like my body was vibrating, but I felt like I had a sudden burst of energy at the same time. It was strange. Um, I then um, decided that I was going to... Um, go and just about my business you know I, I wanted to go to the shops I wanted to um, do all kinds of stuff and I made a huge mistake of going shopping and a lady in the shop um, one of the uh, uh, one of the people who worked there she saw me and she said you've had a procedure haven't you and said you should be at home resting no no you shouldn't be doing this and I, I got a taxi home from from a shop I also had to go to the local hospital to uh, have some blood work done just to check my levels that day the tingling really ramped up really ramped up as I said it felt like I had a big ring of tingling around here and I was so exhausted I had that burst of energy and then I crashed. Um, I was taking, I don't know how many of these. 
I was drinking milk, I was eating cheese, you know, they said to me, make sure you have your dairy. It was doing naff all. I was tingling like you wouldn't believe. So I phoned 111 and to get a specialist who knows about hyperparathyroidism is difficult because most people have heard of thyroids, they haven't heard of parathyroids and even many doctors don't know a lot about it. Um, so they just said to me, go to the hospital. So we got a taxi, it cost 20 quid a time to get a taxi to the hospital. Um, I got there and um, I um, had the normal assessments and everything. I then had an IV put in. Um, the blood showed that I'd had, that my calcium was low. They then said to me, right, uh, change your plan, because they, the specialist on the on call, he was talking to an endocrinologist uh, somewhere about what to do with me, and they said, change your plan, go home, take your calcium, but come back tomorrow and we'll give you an IV. So I came back the next day and I was told to go to the ambulatory clinic. And when I got there, this lovely Scottish lady, um, she came over to me and she said, yes, I, I want to see you. I requested that I see you, that, that I see you personally. Can you get yourself sorted and come and see me? So I got my, um, you know, put all my bits somewhere and, um, and she said to me, right, the reason I wanted to see you, and she pointed to her neck, she said, I had my th thyroids done. And I said, yeah, but mine were parathyroids. She goes, I know, but when I had my thyroids done, it rendered my parathyroids useless. They hadn't woken up in four years, she said. So I personally know what it's like to have non-functioning parathyroids. She said, that's why I specifically asked to see you because I knew what to do. I had um, bloods done. Um, I had my blood pressure taken. Um, I was really scared at this point and I was really tired. Um, this was a Friday, this, so this was five days after the procedure. Um, I was in one of the, it's like a big chair which could recline and I was relaxing in there for a little bit and then the bloods came back to say yes my um, my calcium level, my adjusted calcium level was 1.9 whereas actually it was 1.8 which is lower than it should be. It should be, anyone's uh, calcium level should be between 2.1 and 2.4 I think. Mine was 1.9. So I was given two IVs. I was also prescribed um, effervescent magnesium because magnesium and calcium, they're in the same group on the periodic table, they work together. And vitamin D is also very important for calcium absorption. So I was prescribed the magnesium and I was told to, you know, take as much as I needed of the ADCAL. She sent me on my merry way. Even Though that was the case, despite um, the several, um, despite these two IVs, despite having a lunch there and everything like that, I was still tingling. I got the bus home that day. I was tingling, tingling, tingling all the way home. And she said to me that she wanted me to come back the next day. But I said, look, I'm absolutely shattered. And she said, yeah, I think, I think you do need to rest actually so it was agreed I would rest the whole weekend and the other half was actually she told me off because I was trying to do housework I was trying to do all I was just trying to bounce back I was trying to be exactly as I was before and I didn't realize exactly how um how much this had taken out of me I was tired but I was thinking I'll be all right you know the mind was willing Mind over matter. A few weeks ago, I, I bought a, um, a weighted blanket, one of the best investments I've ever, ever had. Brilliant for autistic people. It really makes you feel nice and secure. And I, I got my pillows and everything and I lounged out on the sofa with my weighted blanket. I had a damn good sleep. I watched Netflix. Um, totally fell in love with Hannah Gatsby. Love her. Um, and that whole weekend I just rested and it was a good thing I did. On the Monday I went back to the hospital and as soon as one of the nurses saw me, not the same one that treated me, but another one she saw me, she goes, oh yeah, you're here to see um, uh, that, you know, the consultant nurse. And she went, you look so much better. I had the mask on, 
but she said you look so much better she could see in my eyes i was much better i had um, my bloods done and my calcium was still 1.9 but they said to be honest it's we're not really going to get it much higher so she said come back again um on thursday and she was absolutely adamant and she'd said to me the friday before she said she said you're not going back to work i, I said yeah but i work from home so i'm not really going to be doing much i'm just going to be sat at home you know at my computer and she said no you are not doing that because you'd have to sit up and concentrate for eight hours you you need to recline you need to take your mind away from it you need to take your body away from it you need to relax so i did i was then ready to come back to work the following week and it was perfectly fine um the thursday that that week um i went back and she said right you need some more magnesium and your, your levels are still not high enough but they're not dangerously low the last time i saw the consultant nurse was on the friday the friday after the friday after the surgery <laughs> If that makes sense and she said in the politest possible way i hope i never see you again <laughs> so yeah fine and luckily i haven't had to have iv calcium since i've had bouts of lots of tingling which have sometimes kept me up which contributed to how exhausted i was feeling when i was having the iv as well they they wrapped me up in a big crocheted blanket and i had a bit of a sleep while i was there but that weekend after the surgery the, that following weekend i really needed that weekend to rest um and i've made sure i've i've rested ever since now i've heard from a lot of people that it t can take about a full year to completely recover from this type of surgery um now if you've s seen the photos that i've just given you the the actual scar what's that Ugh. i did not know that was there the actual scar was was glued a nice line of glue um, there was one stitch and it was just at this side here and it was all poking out it was a, it was like a clear bit of wire like transparent wire and then the wife said to me the other day the stitches come out i haven't had to go back to that hospital since and i'm pleased about that i've stayed on top of the calcium and i've also bought <laughs> those are the berry flavors being a berry i like berries but i have to say the citrus ones are better yeah the, these are these are good but they can get a bit monotonous with the flavor and um they're very dry as well you have to chew them you have to you can't just swallow them and they can really make your mouth feel dry um and so can tums you know i need to make sure i'm you know drinking a lot of water as well um and <laughs> one thing that the uh, consultant nurse said to me she said she said make sure you take your dairy she says you can take supplements if you want as well so make sure you take your dairy and so it was brilliant i could have as much cheese as i love you know and then one night i had too much cheese and threw it all up far too much cheese i shouldn't do that i've also um got myself this i'll show you it it's a big peel caddy and it's full of supplements and medication in there is my sertraline which i'm now on 100 mils for after my mum died i I needed something to help and so my doctor increased my sertraline from 50 mils to 100 mils um i also take multivitamins now um i take um prescribed vitamin d and of course in there is the prescribed alpha calcidol the ad cal i can't fit in there because they're big discs you know so in there i've also got uh flaxseed um fish oil evening primrose milk thistle for the liver um green tea which i take one a day of and i also bought um a supplement of calcium together with magnesium vitamin d and zinc so i'm taking all of those and that really really has helped i still get tingles i'm slightly tingling right now just in my left hand like this morning i woke up with quite a bit of um pins and needles and one thing that one thing you need to really be careful of if you when you have low calcium is something called tetany which is when it's very serious where the jaw fuses up like that and you can't open up your hands like at one point my hand was like this and i couldn't 
I mean, I could, but at an effort. And yesterday my hand was doing that as well. So I can always tell if um, the seizing is starting to take place. If I relax my hand and it doesn't do that, if it does that, then I know that that's a problem. One thing that a, f a friend of mine who's also got ME1 who's had this surgery, she said to me, the brain fog lifted and it has i feel mentally so much better part of me feels like i could come off the sertraline but that's the problem um sometimes when people feel better on antidepressants or whatever they think oh i can start to come off it now i'm doing fine i'll be all right without it but no you feel fine because of the medication vitamin d deficiencies um can contribute to depression and hyperparathyroidism can contribute to depression because it affects the chemistry in the brain but antidepressants or whatever you want to call them um, they help to counter that balance so I'm sticking to all of this so far and these these medicines have really helped with my joints as well I actually haven't been aching so much I don't know whether that's the the effects of the fact that I think the reason why my blood calcium was so low even though I was taking so much was because my bones needed them as soon as there was any extra calcium in my blood my bones were like <sniffs> having that and I've actually found that my wrists and my ankles have not quite been so achy um, the next thing I really want to do is lose a huge amount of weight. I am morbidly obese. I think sometimes my tendency to overeat probably stems back to when I was a baby and um, I was in quite a neglectful home where I was just given biscuits to eat. And when I went into foster care, I didn't know when my next meal was going to be, so I just ate and ate and ate. And um, when I first came to the woman who would then become my adoptive mother my nickname was Erry Biscuit <laughs> it also was Erry Berry which is why I called my my channel um Erry Berry while we're here I'm gonna take a Tums oh purple one I don't know what that is blueberry I think so yeah this is um me with no makeup just having done a little bit of a facial um I've love left nothing oh yeah Oh, I know what that was. Um, yeah, after um, doing my face and said put um, ice cube on, I wrapped the ice cube in tissue. So I think bits of tissue got stuck to my skin. Um, I tell you what, I'm going to go and play some Skyrim now. Definitely. It's been really nice seeing you again. Or not seeing you. Nice for you to see me, probably. Not. Either way, um, I hope you're all well wherever you are. So, yeah, this is a, a hybrid of a video. Um, not only did we do a face mask, we also did an anecdote, we talked about MEM1, so I'll see you all soon. Bye!